Being interested might not make you a scientist, but it certainly leads you to discover more about the universe. My next guest is Robin Ince, who has released his latest book this month, The Importance of Being Interested. The foreword is written by Professor Brian Cox, his partner on BBC Radio 4 show, The Infinite Monkey Cage, and he's currently on tour in independent bookshops across the UK. As usual, Robin brings a level of humour whilst pondering questions of the universe. So let's find out more. So Robin, welcome to Tea Time with me, Ali Monjack. So how's it going? Goodness, it sounds like you've been really busy. You're on tour at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, well, I get very kind of manic ideas when I've got nothing to do. And of course, during lockdown, uh, I was trying to make as much stuff as possible. And I was meant to be doing an arena tour with uh, Brian Cox. We were going to be doing the start of our Horizons tour. And uh, and then obviously we decided to postpone it because it was a very large scale thing to do in still uncertain times. And that's when I came up with a stupid idea of going, I know, I'll go to 100 independent bookshops in the United Kingdom in about 50 or 60 days. That that'll be a thing to do won't it and so uh so that's what i'm doing at the moment is rattling around doing kind of two or three talks a day um across the uk which is uh it's really exciting it's lovely because some of them are kind of quite big bookshops and some of them are, are almost just corners of, uh, of of little kind of just arcades and some of them are activist bookshops and some of them are nature bookshops and many of them are bookshop bookshops Bookshop, bookshop. So, I mean, you know, for those who, who don't know, this is all to do with your latest book, The Importance of Being Interested. And I mean, you're about as close to a scientist as a scientist gets without actually being a scientist, if that makes sense. <laughs> Would the scientists allow such things? I think it's that bit that I, I think I've managed this in quite a few things that I've done, is that I can appear to know what I'm talking about as long as there's no one in the room who really knows what they're talking about. And then <laughs> I will back away. But yeah, I mean, that's what I love doing is I, I love uh, always with all the stuff that I've done is I, I used to say at the beginning of shows, you know, if I say if there's any ideas you hear that you really enjoy, don't tell your friends until you've Googled it first, because I may well have misunderstood it. Uh, so it's like don't, always double <laughs> check because my, you know I, I just fill my brain with as much stuff as possible and then shake it around and see what kind of bursts out but I mean doesn't googling stuff get you into trouble anyway I think I think it really does doesn't it yeah, I mean, that's part of the thing, isn't it? Of the battles that we have at the moment is that we, we don't really know how critical thinking works. So someone goes up and you see, and so many websites are set up to go, well, this looks like a proper, you know, it's, it's basically like a guy selling snake oil, putting on a white coat and a stethoscope and going, hello, I really am kind of a doctor. Try my magic <laughs> medicine. Well, yeah, and I, I think that would probably sell really well in the, the, the current sort of climate after the pandemic as well. But I mean, as far as you're concerned, I mean, you've been doing the infinite monkey cage, haven't you, on uh, BBC Radio 4 since 2009 and, you know, partners up with, with Professor Brian Cox. Um, and it, it, it really is sort of like a marriage made in the universe, shall we say, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> Because, you know, he is obviously, you know, the, the scientist, um, but, you know, portrays science um, so that it's easily accessible for people, doesn't he, really? Um, well, he does sometimes. There was that night in Glasgow where they were very confused. And it, it, it's been a, it's a fun <laughs> thing to watch, actually, is, is the... Uh, because um, we've just we have done a load of warm up shows for the tour that is now um, um, postponed uh, and probably starts in February in New Zealand. But it's uh, I always remember we did a gig in 2011 in uh, the King's Theatre in Glasgow, wonderful old theatre. And Brian had just found out loads of things about the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the latest information that was coming out that was suggesting that, you know, the, the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. It's great big ideas that there really were going to be incredible breakthroughs in understanding. And he was so excited by it, he forgot that everyone else hadn't worked there for a while. And it was a beautiful thing to watch <laughs> because the audience kind of were confused, but they enjoyed being confused. They think, I haven't got a clue what he's talking about, but I think he understands and that's comforting. But I think, yeah, more, more often than not, he, he's, he's extremely good at, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lovely thing as well because we've been friends for a long time and there isn't 
a, a pretend Brian Cox that gets put out on the television where he goes, oh, no, you've got to turn the cameras on now. Now I'm going to have to pretend to love science. Uh, you know, he really is the whole time. You know, we, we, we God, I don't know how many miles we did. 2019, we did 120 gigs in, in both the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. And, um, you know, every night there would be a bit where I'd suddenly go, oh, Brian, you know that idea uh, about neutrinos and the reason they don't? And, and then he would just go off on one excited smiling you know the delight in and, and equally sometimes I think on that tour someone asked how slinkies work and um <laughs> neither of us were certain so we spent about 20 minutes on stage thinking about what it would be about a slinky that would allow it to appear to walk downstairs and uh and you know just that joy <laughs> of also exploring what is not necessarily you know in his mind yes absolutely and I mean you did actually break a world record there didn't you I think you you managed to in, in, uh, capture an audience of a quarter of a million people on your world tour, which was really quite something. But, you know, for you, you have always kind of been interested in science, haven't you? And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, in your latest book, I mean, you haven't written a book since um, I'm a joke and so are you. And that was in 2018, wasn't it? Mm. But you know, in your latest book, it, it really is looking at your, um, how you sort of stumbled on the questions of the universe and what, what, what makes things tick. And I mean, you've interviewed some amazing people as well, haven't you? Well, this was the thing that was lucky, you know, sometimes during bad times, things like, you know, the pandemic, which was, of course, terrible for many people and very difficult for many of us to kind of work. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to find the advantages sometimes. And the advantage was everyone was trapped at home. So no one had an excuse when I asked if I could interview them. So I had this incredible, I mean, in fact, at the back of the book, the number of people listed who, who don't even appear in it, but who were all brilliant and all said wonderful things. But my publisher wanted a 90,000 word book. I delivered a 220,000 word one we eventually cut it down to 120,000 words and oh getting the chance to speak to people like Jane Goodall who is such a you know a pioneer in 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 her field in terms of the understanding that we now have about chimpanzees and and therefore also about ourselves so people like that were fantastic then Brian Eno and, and and Neil Gaiman and 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 all the astronauts were about so Nicole Stott who's who's a, a wonderfully uh humane I mean all the astronauts that I've met and spoken to I think I've been tremendously lucky because they are all quite brilliant first of all quite brilliant merely the fact they were able to do those things but mm. secondly quite brilliant at expressing what it is and why it is important to go in space so talking to Nicole Starr or Apollo 9's uh Rusty Schweikart yeah it was it was and it was a good way of spending time because every day I just have about five different zoom meetings uh and and I'd just be thinking oh yeah that's a good idea for a chapter and I'll take it there and I'll take it there and yeah it's very exciting and sort of discovering, you know, things about the universe, I mean, which is, you know, I mean, haven't we learned a lot? You're right, in lockdown, it, it, it is really interesting, you know, as far as the space thing is concerned. And, and of course, now we've got, you know, I mean, I think it was William Shatner and um, William Prince of Wales who had a bit of a head to head, didn't they, about <laughs> would that should they really be looking into space or looking after the planet so you know that that that's very much a sort of topic of the time um but you know for you I mean you say that you kind of lost your interest in science you know at the Bunsen burners when mm. you know you were a young lad in secondary school and it, is it really do you think it, it's probably the way it's taught isn't it I think it's a real problem because a lot of the teachers that I speak to, they and this is not just in science, this is across the board, this thing where you just have to keep hitting targets and, and you're not delivering curiosity, that so much of it is about saying, the kids need to know these five facts by the end of Tuesday, so do that now, which is, of course, totally different to enthusing yeah. children. And yet, of course, all the teachers I know are tremendously enthusiastic individuals. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, the frustration of going every year, there's more equations just to memorise. 
And that's not understanding. And that's not exciting about science. And that's what happened to me. And, you know, we are lucky. We, we have tremendous teachers in, uh, in the United Kingdom, but they are so often battling against uh, dull curriculums, which are not meant to inspire people. They're meant to just give them a certain number of facts. Um, and that's really what happened with me. It was, I think, in, in primary school, uh, science is, uh, is something you're, tangible. You're touching leaves and looking at all the nature around you and thinking about the stars. And then it becomes something which seems to be a set of symbols and numbers. And I think it's also, to some extent, designed to uh, weed out who's going to be a scientist in the way that history and English are not taught in the way that going, we want to know who's going to be a historian. But with science, I think it is eventually the ones who get to. I mean, it was a bit I was doing a, a lovely little bookshop in uh, in Settle called Limestone Books last Monday. Yeah, it was Monday. And uh, and there was a young woman there who was doing her physics A level. And in her local school, she was the only girl who'd done, done physics, a, physics A-level for five years. Wow. You know, and that is, uh, and she obviously <laughs> loved it so much. And she was so disappointed that more people and not more, more women in her school weren't carried along into physics as well. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, what an apt um, phrase, title rather, for your book, you know, the importance of being interested um, but, you know, this was, I, I think, a lecture you went to, isn't it, or a part of the, the British Humans Association. Isn't that right? Was it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think there, there was a, a, a... I'm trying to think of what if it was, because there were a few things that really got me back into it. One, one of them was a headline in The Independent many, many years ago, which said, echoes of the Big Bang can still be heard around the universe. And I was like, what? The universe is huge and Big Bang was ages ago. That can't be right. And I remember just reading more about that. And that was one of the things that drew me in. Um, and, and then reading Carl Sagan, who did the brilliant TV series Cosmos, his wonderful book, Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. But yeah, there were, there were many, many different things, many, many different angles that kind of like eventually I was, I, I was, I'm really robbing myself of a tremendous richness of the possibility of looking at the world uh, if I don't uh, just start engaging a little bit with science. And it doesn't mean that you have to understand science deeply as well. I think some people beat themselves up the moment they don't understand some book about quantum mechanics. Uh, they kind of go, oh, well, I obviously haven't got a science brain. And you go, no, 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 most people will read through the book, uh, whichever book it might, and they'll pick up little bits and pieces. But you, you're not necessarily, you're not going to entirely understand quantum mechanics in one book, because if you could, the Nobel Prize is around the corner for you. <laughs> Yeah, well, sadly, I don't think that's going to happen for me either. But <laughs> there you go. Well, I, think that's, I mean, it's very much the, the, the real drive behind the book was I wanted to deal with lots of subjects which made people um, sometimes gave them a bit of existential anxiety, the size of the universe, the death of the universe, dealing with our own uh, death as well, how we're connected to all other living things. Um, and, and is there life in the universe? And I thought, you know, if I, I just wanted to go into lots of areas and try and gather as many stories as possible, and as many ideas that would mean that at the end of a chapter, someone might go, oh, I need to know more about that. So it's like a kind of, I mean, excuse me, an introduction to a lot of these ideas and, and to hopefully enthuse people to go, it's OK. I, I mean, I've already, you know, people have started reading it now because because it came out uh, um, back, back at the beginning of October. And uh, and it's nice to start getting a reaction from people or when I'm doing the shows and people say, oh, yeah, I really didn't think I was allowed to like science. And they come along and sometimes their kids have brought them as well. So, you know, an 11 year old has, has brought their their mum. And their mum's gone, oh, I didn't know I'd like to. But my daughter said, no, mum, let's go and see this. There's going to be an interesting thing about chimpanzees and black holes. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And I mean, you say in the book, haven't you? I, I have to confess, I haven't read it all. But I mean, you do say in it that, you know, it, it's sometimes scary, isn't it? For, for people on the outside world who are not in science to think everything is about hardcore facts. You know, everything has to be factual. And there's no room for, and then that doesn't allow room for magic, does it? Really? Well, that's the thing is, I think there are, and, and in, certainly on the tour at the moment, I think I'm increasing the amount that I talk about that. The fact that you, you can have reason and equations, and you can also find space for 
it, well, I mean, I, I should say to me, actually, you know, science is driven by imagination in the same way art is driven by imagination, though they might go off at times in different directions and to different places. You know, all scientists that I know, their starting point was a tremendous excitement with an idea. It was seeing the Aurora Borealis or it was, you know, it's beginning to understand DNA and thinking about the code inside all of us. And it comes from a very excited place. Um, but I think, yes, it, it's uh, you, you are able to. I mean, I talk about time quite a lot in the book, and I think there's a beautiful beautiful way of looking at time which is not a horizontal line but the time is stacked on top of things so sometimes you can stand on a beautiful hill and as you stand there and you just allow your mind to drift for a while and think about how many other people have looked out across this view and how that view has changed and how the rocky outcrops have changed and how maybe the rocky outcrop you're looking at used to be a coral reef in the middle of the sea but now it's in the middle of Derbyshire and that's the way you know all of those things that allow you to drift off and have your own kind of you know web of dreams when you're looking at those things and then there is a point when you have to go uh if you're a scientist you have to, to then go right now i need to to work out exactly what i'm studying now i need to scrutinize it now i need to put my head of of you know intense reason on but you also drifting off you know as einstein and his incredible ideas they came from daydreaming yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, so really, I think they were visionaries, weren't they? I mean, yeah. you know, and we, we hear about, you know, billionaires these days like Bezos um, and, you know, Richard Branson. And it, it's really, it's all started with that dream of going into space, hasn't it, really? And that mm, visualising. I'm not very sure about that lot. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I, I don't know I, I i worry that the drive for it comes from the wrong place that it comes from exactly what every astronaut i've met is not like this kind of uh you know yeah i'm gonna go into space yeah, i'm gonna beat you into space i'm gonna go even far you know further than you mm. and it seems to be almost too driven by that kind of uh, sometimes it feels to me the male ego um whereas you know the astronauts that I've spoken to, and and you know people as well like Charlie Duke, who who's he's only briefly in the book. I didn't manage to interview him for the book, but I have interviewed him in the past, and he was an Apollo astronaut. He stood on the moon, and uh, and the humility of it is one of the things. And and like with Rusty Schweikart, who was Apollo Nine, you know his thing is that we need to start thinking about moving beyond the planet Earth if we are able to really be a species that will survive in the in the universe and he is you know he would love to once i spoke to him he said you know that his dream is that we will be a good enough species to be invited onto the panel of the intergalactic extraterrestrial kind of you know council of the universe um so i think yeah i mean it's not that i'm tremendously anti it i think anything that inspires people to go in. but as you said before as well you know we have to work out because very often something like the space race people will go oh all that money could have been spent on on feeding people but actually that money probably wouldn't have ended up going there and in fact the money very often from space expeditions has been made back many times with the discoveries that have been made and the technological mm. innovations that have come from it you know in terms of dealing with the fact that we we should be able to deal with world hunger and deal with poverty and deal with so many people. I, I, I think that requires not just a change of mind of astronauts, it requires all human beings to think very closely about what our priorities are. I mean, very much the activists you always are, Robin, aren't you really? So, I mean, yeah. I'm a very lazy one. I've got <laughs> friends who really do it properly in a brilliant <laughs> Well, but, you know, I mean, well, with everything that you do, you are sort of driving people forward, aren't you? Um, with, you know, ideas about the universe, which is a great thing. I mean, for example, you started the Cosmic Shambles Network, didn't you, in 2017, which is a series of podcasts on um, documentaries and events that, you know, are interesting for people to learn about, you know, science and have an open mind. Well, that's what I want is I, I don't like being bored. So I like making stuff all the time. And uh, and also because I, I, I try and I, I get lots of books sent to me. And I'm like, oh, that one looks brilliant. And that one's, I'm very scatty though. I kind of start a book and then I find a thing and then I go, oh, now I need to read that one. And now I need to read that one. I'm all over the shop. But it mm. is, um, I, I, I think it's just that I hear so many brilliant ideas and I want to share them with as many people as possible. And so with 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 my friend Trent and with with my friend Josie Long, we just wanted to, you know, we, we would meet people and we would go, 
everyone needs to know about them. And, you know, it's like there's a lovely book, Catherine Mannix. I don't know if you've come across Catherine Mannix. She's wonderful. She's an ex-doctor. She wrote a wonderful book about dealing with death. And she's just written a book about um, how to listen to people who've experienced trauma and loss. And you read the book and you hear her voice and you go, everyone needs to read this. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes there's a there's a book that I've just seen, which is just beautiful paintings of birds' nests. And, they're, and in the book, they are life size. And it's so beautifully written and painted. And you go, everyone needs to see this book. So a lot of it is this kind of, you know, a missionary zeal. And I think especially as well, because so many of the voices in the mass media are negative voices. They're voices of criticism. They're, they're voices of envy and, 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 and greed. And um, so especially with Cosmic Shambles, we really wanted to do something which was just filled with as much delight as possible. There's a, there's a great line from, it's, it's almost what I called the book at one point, actually, Charles Darwin, when he was walking through the Brazilian rainforest, seeing life that he had never imagined could exist when he'd been in England. And he came back one day onto the Beagle and he wrote in his journal, today my mind is a chaos of delight. And I think that's one of the things that kind of pushes us is we just want to, we want to expose people to as many things that might mean that, especially if they're feeling down, one of the the really nice things that's happened during this tour is when I'm signing books, a lot of people go, oh, thanks very much for all those podcasts and stuff you did during lockdown. And it's just a nice thing, isn't it? I'm sure you've had that from, from your work where you just think, oh, good, that made a connection. That was, you know, so many yeah. things in this world are uh, can be about disconnection and finding that way where you go, good, someone... You know, I had a guy who'd just been speaking to both his parents who were in, uh, in hospital. They were... Uh, they were very ill and he was feeling down. And then I don't know what, I can't remember who Josie and me were interviewing that day. So but there was a live interview and it was just something. And it's that bit, isn't it? I think all of these forms of communication that you and I can do now are ways of just sometimes when people, especially during a pandemic, but generally as well, sometimes people can feel very, very alone with all of the problems they have. And then, you know, you, might, you pop up and people go, oh, good. Oh, I like listening to her podcast and it's a bit of a conversation and, and hopefully hear something that will give them some oh, delight really? as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I always feel incredibly lucky. I don't know about you. I mean, obviously, you know, to- totally different situation, but I feel incredibly lucky for the amount of guests I've had on my podcast with amazing stories to tell, you know, really interesting stories to tell. And and things, you know, you know we've, we've kind of dealt with issues and science <laughs> and um, how the brain works and I mean I, I've, I've actually interviewed a couple of people who do podcasts with the, the Cosmic Shambles Network as well so um, so that that was really interesting too and I think you know you're you're right I mean this this book that you've written the importance of being interested and I I, I don't think it's just science I think it's you know the importance of being interested in you know human humanity and, and humankind isn't it yeah and I think it is not but it's not being scared to ask questions um, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of uh, of our problems as human beings is we get so worried about feeling shame we get so worried about being embarrassed and, and very often when you know I've done science shows with friends you get a question and the first thing the question says is I know this is probably a stupid question and you know that person's really had to fight to go oh god can i can i ask this oh all right i will and then they ask it and i can't think of a stupid question uh in terms of the ones that uh, i've dealt with or when i've been doing shows with brian because they've all come from a place of genuine curiosity and it's one of the things you know so much of our life is battling against you know shame and, and and embarrassment and and when you can sometimes manage to do that again it's about the the, the beautiful connection that can be created yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So how many more bookshops have you got to, to go before Christmas then? I know that you're in uh, King's Place, aren't you, for a launch event in London on the 8th? Yeah, that's that's going to be fun. That, that's on the, oh, when is that? 8th of November, that's it. And, and, that's, uh, and I've got some guests as well, because normally, obviously, I'm off on my own, but Katie Mack, who's written a brilliant book about the end of the universe, and uh, David McCormick, the brilliant uh, singer, songwriter, and, and art historian now, um, and, uh, and Helen Chersky is going to join me as well. Um, and, and a few others um, but I'm generally it's meant to be 100 bookshops so because I've done 23 it should technically be 77 but of course what happened was <laughs> lots of bookshops asked and I felt bad about saying no so I think I've still got 
92 or 93 shops to go and then I get my first day off on the 21st of December but that's what I like to do as well run myself down so then it allows me just on Christmas day to go I'm too tired to think about doing anything else and then on Boxing Day I go bored now what am I going to create next (laughs) so that that, that sounds like the laws of physics to me (laughs) without a doubt so no well, well that'll be brilliant definitely so um, good luck with that. So, I mean, as far as the infinite monkey cage as well is concerned, I um, mean, you're going to be doing more episodes of that, aren't you? Yeah, we were, you know, Brian and me are working on some new things at the moment. And, uh, you know, uh, in terms of thinking about hopefully we could, because we're off around the world, uh, we think, oh, brilliant, we can make shows around the world. Um, Because that's always been, you know, we went out to America a while ago and made a series there. And obviously it gives you access. I mean, that was actually another of the advantages of the pandemic was because we were doing everything by Zoom. On Monkey Cage, we could have guests from anywhere. Yeah. Whereas normally you need to be able to get them all into the radio theatre. So, you know, the first episode back, we had Steve Martin on. And, you know, to have someone like Steve Martin uh, talking about the end of the universe. Again, that was also with Katie Mack and Brian Green and Eric Idle. And, uh, and, and we were able to have, you know, people like Conan O'Brien on and Jane Goodall on. And all these people who would normally be travelling or immersed in production. And, and that was really exciting. So I hope we can, you know, develop something while we're travelling the world as well. Fantastic. Well, that sounds good to me. So is Steve Martin as funny in real life? He's brilliant. I mean, the man's a, uh, I, I've been very lucky. I had dinner with him once. And and of course, he's a very different human being off stage. He's very considered, incredibly smart individual mm. uh, with, you know, deep love of philosophy and art. But his timing is still absolutely perfect. So when he does the comedy stuff, I and mean, there were a couple of bits on Monkey Cage where that was just the classic <laughs> Steve Martin he, he has he, he's a he, his book Born Standing Up about being a stand-up comic is I think probably the best or certainly in the top two books about um stand-up ever written so it is a real sometimes you forget you I was kind of sat there and then I suddenly you go that is Steve Martin do you remember that bloke who when you were 11 you watched the jerk and it was the funniest thing you'd ever seen yeah. and then you watched Man with Two Brains and you watched it over <laughs> and over again you sat with him now it's amazing <laughs> Oh, no, 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 that, that, that sounds really brilliant. So, I mean, you've won many awards, haven't you? You've won a Tortle Awards. I mean, you've won, you know, quite a few Time Out Awards for, for various different things that you, you've done over the years. So um, let's just see, maybe you might win an award for the importance of being interesting. Yeah, come on, come on. I want a prize. <laughs> I, want, I want something made of perspex or that looks like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I yeah, I mean, I think you know, perhaps Brian will be able to give you an award himself, won't he? Well, he's got spare ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a point in which his mantelpiece won't be able to take the weight of them all, and he'll just say, "Yeah, you you have that. It's too heavy. It's making <laughs> oh, the fireplace teeter." And of course, he's off this this week. Actually, launching on um, the BBC Two is his new program called The Universe, isn't it? So. Um, so, I mean, interesting. That'll be really interesting to watch, I think, for lots of people, won't it? Really? Yeah, I think he's really pleased with that one as well. Obviously, we've been talking about it during uh, uh, over, over the last uh, of a few months. And I think, it, and, and as usual, I mean, the graphics are, I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about those shows is they will have a sudden moment of, of, of quite difficult science, quite, quite counter instinctual to the way that we view the world because we view the world in such a kind of small way. And I think the perfect thing is you'll get him explaining an idea and just as your brain begins to fizz and throb, then you kind of go, oh, thank heavens for that. They're giving me beautiful images now and I'm traveling through the universe, which gives you time. Because I think that's often a problem with sometimes when you watch lectures is you do need a break. Every 10 minutes, yeah. someone might have said something like my friend Faye Dauka, who's quite brilliant uh, and she's based at Imperial and she does this fantastic lecture about an introduction to Einstein. And every now and again, you just want to go, oh, can we just have a little break now? Just some nice music. And I just <laughs> want to take this in. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, I think that's why the Infinite Monkey Cage works really well with both of you as well, because actually, you know, you are discussing some serious bits of science you know anything from chemistry to to geology to 
And at, at the same time, you know, you're you're bringing in the the sort of let well let let's have a bit of a, a joke about it and not take it so seriously because <laughs> you well, know if you did, thing. I think your brain can't take it in, can it? Really. Also, scientists have a sense of humour and love playing. I mean, this is one of the things I've, I've talked mm -hmm. to a lot of people about this, you know, that play is such an important part of the way we explore the world, not just as children, as adults, yes. that, that playing with the world and the way that we kind of question the world. And, and I think some people, when Monkey Cage started, were a little bit kind of thrown by it because it was like, this is not how science is done. Science is, hello, welcome to a special show about science. Today, we're <laughs> going to talk about the nature of black holes. I'm joined by an old professor. You know about black holes, don't you? I do know about black holes, yes. Um, whereas we were kind of mucking about as well. Um, but we were always, the, uh, one thing was we, we never wanted to dumb down the science but no. we wanted to have fun with the science. So it was like, you know, in every show, the hope would always be that there would be three ideas with luck, which to an audience, especially non, you know, an audience who weren't scientists, that they would go, oh, that's an interesting idea. I didn't know about that. And then, so as long as we got enough of that, then you can kind of play around with those and you can find the jokes about the those ideas. You know, joking around about the death of the universe and everything that exists about it. That's a nice place to go. It's quite a dark place sometimes to go. And if yeah. someone's just listening, they're going, well, I didn't know the universe was growing, which I should say to everyone who's listening now, this is not anything you should <laughs> worry about immediately. It really is. Uh, in fact, the Earth's not going to be about by then. You're fine. You're fine. Don't... <laughs> If that's the first worry you've got in the day, oh my goodness, the universe is going to end. You're doing well because there's a lot of other things. I mean, you left the milk out last night and it's it's sour now. So that's a starting, that's a bigger worry. Um, but it is, you know, joking around about something uh, which can have really create existential anxiety. Um, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, no, <laughs> it is fun and great to listen to. I mean, you've done about 150 episodes, probably more than that now haven't you so yeah yeah um lucky the universe is big we're not running out of stuff yeah <laughs> have we dealt with all science no i'm afraid you haven't no so i mean yeah i mean uh, there might actually be a sequel will there to to the importance of being interested maybe there might be a sequel to that and we might even make a monkey cage which is bigger than than the infinite one we've got already we yeah. might go to another level of infinity and the infinity and beyond yeah <laughs> Oh, well, Robin, thank you so much for coming on Tea Time today and telling us all about your new book and the best of luck with it. Um, so, I mean, you can go where, where is it available to buy? It's everywhere. Really. You can go to you can get signed copies from CosmicShambles.com. So if you go to CosmicShambles.com, you can get them there. Uh, Hive is a great place to go if you're using online because that goes the some of Hive's money goes to independent bookshops. But it is uh, it's it's that cliche. It's in all good bookshops uh, at the moment. And I am yeah, as I said, I've got uh, hopefully I should be coming to a town near you if you go and look at CosmicShambles.com. Hundred bookshops. It's got the list of all all the shops that I'm coming to and every one that I go. I mean, like this week I'm going to. Hebden Bridge and Crosby and Harrogate and Leighton Buzzard and Norwich and Penzance. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to get around a bit. You are trying to get around a bit. I mean, you love books anyway, you know, bookshops as well, don't you? I mean, one of your books that you actually wrote in 2010 was um, The Bad Book Club, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that was all my lovely Oxfam books that I would go from town to town and just find these the, the strangest of Mills and Boons or weird <laughs> books about the, there was one book I had called How to Marry the Man of Your Choice. Yeah, I know. It's back in those days when you were very, very, very lucky ladies could eventually actually decide to marry someone they wanted to using this special <laughs> manual. Oh, and is there a science in that then? <laughs> certainly not there's none whatsoever i reckon oh so you, you don't believe in uh, love is a chemistry then <laughs> oh no the science in it but there wasn't science in the book how to marry the man of your choice that's where there was no science <laughs> <laughs> oh dear so that's where you fell down was it robin <laughs> yeah still not found him still not found yeah. him Still not found it anyway as i said lovely to have you on tea time and good luck with the book um i'm halfway through reading it, it it's a very interesting read it really really is um and you know also the input from i mean the forward is is by um brian anyway isn't it Press yeah brian. so 
Um, and uh, and that... on the audio version, he actually reads it, whereas the last book I did, I had a forward by uh, the comedian Stuart Lee, and uh, he just wasn't around, so I just did an impression of Stuart Lee just doing the... Uh... <laughs> doing the forward going you know i did this gig with robin back in in 1992 and and i thought well if it worse comes to worse i can do brian's voice as well but this time it really is him because some people did ask they go have you done the same trick as last time for the audio <laughs> version were they not available and you had to do it I went no that one really is brian yeah <laughs> oh dear no no it was it's it's really brilliant so Thank you know I um, think everybody should should have a read, and especially if you are daunted by science, because I think you know you, you quite clearly make it you know accessible and actually really um, you know like you can ask stupid questions as well, and mm. you know because we don't know it all, do we? Really, we're oh. you're absolutely right. We're just taught that you know whatever's in the media at the time is what is going on in the universe. Hmm. Yeah, and the science is changing all the time. You know, this is the thing, which is it, you know, it, it's always coming up with what I would call the least wrong answer. So it uses the best information we have, the best technology we have, and science at its best comes up with an answer that says it's never 100% true, because when it becomes 100% true, then it becomes dogma. And then you're not allowed to question it. But it does become very, very hard, some of it, to prove that there's another. So whether it's about evolution or whether it's about the beginning of the universe. Uh, in fact, we don't quite know the very beginning of the universe, but about the expansion of the universe. These ideas are ideas that really are very, very strong ideas that are worth following and understanding. But there is always the possibility for change. Absolutely. Well, thank you and good luck. And, and um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to meet you face to face on the 8th of November. Yeah, I'll see you the the the, the last the, the final gig when you will see a destroyed old man in a cardigan <laughs> on whatever it is, his hundred and twenty third gig, dragging himself. Well, I'm not down. coming to it's listen to you. Well, I'm just coming to listen to Helen Chertsky, so don't worry. <laughs> oh, and that one, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking of the one in Hungerford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah, that will be a lot of fun. The one in London at King's Place. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, you take care, Robin. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Look forward to chatting with my next guest on the Tea Time Sofa this time next Saturday. In the meantime, if you would love to get in touch about having a chat with me, you can reach me on Tea Time at forthenow.co.uk or you can find me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram on Tea Time with AM. Bye for now.